uh, about 2020 was the, the word of the year um, it w was un unprecedented. Uh, yes. uh, and and I find in the investment world that's objectionable. That actually it actually irritates me because uh, we, we've had hundreds, if not thousands, of stock market um, crashes in, in the last 130, 140 years. In fact, you can go right back before that to the 1600s, you know, with other kinds of investment markets. So, so to say that um, a market crash is unprecedented is rubbish. Hi everyone, I'm Petrus and welcome to Worldview. Worldview is a podcast where we explore everyone's perspectives on all things that can broaden our worldview. If you've watched our content so far and liked it, please consider liking, subscribing and donating on Patreon. Today we're talking with Warren Ingram. Warren Ingram is the co-founder of Galileo Capital and was the South African Financial Planning Institute's Financial Planner of the Year in 2011. Warren is a regular on the 702 Radio and Cape Talk's The Money Show. He writes periodic, sorry, he writes monthly articles periodically for a range of different publications. He's also the author of How to Make Your First Million and the best-selling Become Your Own Financial Advisor. Warren, welcome to the show. Thanks, Beatrice. Appreciate it. Warren, you know, there's always you know, there's, there's there's a couple of things which, in terms of um, selling advice to people as a consultant, that definitely always sells. But one of them that definitely sells the best is telling people how to make money. It's like the one thing that everybody wants to know about. And you're quite the expert with, with uh, about this with two books um, specifically about being your own financial advisor and managing your money correctly. Could you just perhaps give us like a you know a short summary of the top points on uh, how to make your first million, the book that you wrote? Yeah. So. Uh... I wrote it firstly um, to, to try and help people who don't really know much about money, but have lots of money questions. So, so I guess the first point is it's written in plain English uh, with as little jargon as possible, and it's designed to be as approachable as possible for people that don't have financial knowledge. Uh, it's not a textbook. It's not a, a, a motivational speaking book written by an American with big shiny teeth. Uh, and, and the idea is that it's, um, it's to say, what are the steps to achieving your financial freedom goals? Because that, that's really what it's all about. You know, the, the title is, I, I mean, I, I always feel it's, it, it feels a bit like clickbait to me. You know, you, you have to put a million in a title and you attract a lot of interest. But, but the reality is it's hard to get to financial freedom. And that's unfortunately too much of a title to put in a book. So it's about the three steps to financial freedom. And then critically, it's about uh, how do you decide to make those trade-offs between wanting to spend money now and having to delay that gratification uh, to build up your money. And, and it's where everyone falls over in, in most instances. So it's about forming, forming a vision for your life, finding reasons that are important to you that will help you make those trade-offs when you need to make them. And then it gives you, uh, I think, some pretty relevant case studies of real South Africans from various backgrounds with various educational uh, you know, backgrounds as well, how they've achieved their, their first million of investments. So, so it gives proper real life examples. And I think critically, it is a South African book written for South Africans. So it's not American mm. stuff um, written by Kiyosaki or one of those. It's, it's for our country uh, you know, and, and, and from our country, I guess. And it's actually the best thing because, I mean, in a lot of scenarios, if you just take whatever savings you have and you put them in the savings account, there's always that temptation that you're like, OK, you know, there's like a rainy day here or it's just struggling. But here, I'm going to take it out of the savings fund and immediately going to you know, spend that money. And that's what makes it difficult to keep. Whereas if you invest, there's almost like a. I want to say not not a barrier to entry, but rather a barrier to exit in terms of taking that money out and then spending again, which is why investing is so good for um, making sure that the money retains its value and how you spend it and not, you know, spend it too easily or too quickly. Um, in that regard, I want to ask, you know, what would you say is the best areas to invest in in the current environment? I mean, especially with COVID-19, it's really rocked to the apple cart, you know, in certain industries, obviously, you'd think it would do amazing and others, especially in restaurants and so are struggling at the moment. People aren't sure on what to invest in because when is the next unexpected thing going to come in? So that's what's interesting about uh, about 2020 was the, the word of the year um, it was un unprecedented. Yes. Uh, and and I find in the investment world, that's objectionable. That actually, it actually irritates me because uh, we, we've had hundreds, if not thousands of stock market um, crashes in, in the last 130, 140 years. In fact, you can go right back before that to the 1600s, you know, with other kinds of investment markets. So, so to say that um, a market crash is unprecedented is rubbish. 
Um, and, and the reality is that there is always a different reason why markets crash and why investment markets get unsettled. Uh, and so the reason might be unprecedented, but the result is absolutely normal. Why is it normal? Because markets are eventually driven by you, me, and all our investment uh, co colleagues in the world. And, and, and fortunately or unfortunately, human beings haven't changed in tens of thousands of years. We are emotional. We have a lizard brain and we have a rational brain. When, when uh, life happens, our lizard brain kicks in. We get uh, fearful, we get greedy, whatever it is. Uh, and, and we cause markets to move in a, in a cycle, up or down. So, hmm. so in a time like we had last year, and, and it's still unfolding uh, in, in, in 2021, and I'm sure we'll go into 2022, you know, you know, the reason why the markets are unsettled is, is, is unusual, not unprecedented. Uh, there, there was a global pandemic, uh, you know, 1918, right? So, so it's not unprecedented. It's, it's rubbish to say that. But, but the reality is, uh, what should you be doing with your money? A long answer to your short question. Uh, I, I feel that uh, firstly, get your mix of assets right. In other words, get how much you want to allocate to shares and property and bonds and cash, get that decision right, and then start to make decisions about committing the money. So, so most of us spend so much time saying, should I buy Amazon? Should I buy Alphabet? You know, should I buy Tesla, GameStop or whatever it is? Uh, and, and we don't really focus on, well, how much of all of my assets should I actually allocate to shares? And that's the mistake. So, so what happens is we're focusing on a piece of a puzzle and we've forgotten to look at, at the picture on the box. And, and the reality is the picture on the box is most critical and each piece of a puzzle you know, is, is fine, but it's not the critical factor. And, and so to, to me, I would say uh, the starting point is that, that most of us should have in the range of about 35% of our investments to around 75% of our investments in shares. Now, now the range for you might be different to me, and it will be based on things like our age, how long we prepared to invest, how much uh, of the roller coaster of stock markets can we psychologically tolerate? Because you know right. each of us is different there. Uh, and and once you've kind of worked out those factors, and just very briefly, if you're younger, got a longer time to invest, more money in shares. If you're older, don't have a tolerance, um, shorter time to invest, uh, re reduce your allocation. So so I would say that's my starting point: is get that decision right, then. When the market falls apart, and it's going to fall apart almost in every year of our history as a stock market in South Africa and globally, the market falls by 10% in the calendar year. I don't know if you know that, but, uh, but, that, but you know, it doesn't feel like that, right? So we feel like there's good times and bad times, and actually yeah. they happen like this in the year. Yeah. Uh, so I would be quite greedy to invest my money in shares when the markets have fallen apart. I would be most greedy <clears throat> when there's a pandemic or when there's a a, a, a war or something like that but for the rest i'd be i'd be patient so i'm just gonna grab some water no no sure yeah definitely i mean this is this is actually such a good point that you make because i mean we've seen massive stock market growth actually in a lot of industries um during the pandemic it's, it's like a lot of people actually had um I, I can't remember where i saw this i'll have to go and get the source because it was it was amazing but basically what they said was is that a lot of people didn't have money because they lost their jobs right so they didn't have income but a lot of people also stopped spending because you know so the, the, there was the point being is, is they had a lot of saved capital for their rainy day but they didn't really have a lot to spend it on they pretty much needed food and necessities but the rest of the time they stayed at home they didn't spend it on holidays they didn't spend it on anything else and for some countries they even got a stimulus so you know they they got a capital influx and perhaps they were prepared for that environment but then suddenly they had this cash here and they didn't really know what to spend it on. And so a lot of people actually decided to spend it on the stock market, which is why we saw a great stock market growth in certain environments. But, you know, a lot of people have, I mean, they, they have different reactions to this. I think it's so um, important what you just said. It's like not only diversify within your shares, but diversify within your portfolio as well. Don't just go shares, you know, go bonds as well. Go, you know, all the different elements. But a lot of people feel like, oh, man, I, I put this into bonds. If I just put it into Tesla shares, my portfolio would have grown 500 percent. You know, people have a different type of reaction about this. And because of that, they sometimes don't follow your financial advice. I mean, you know, what, what reasons do you think these individuals have to not follow your advice? Is it ignorance? Is it like a psychological thing? What's the balance there? It, it's, it's actually probably uh, um, a combination. So, so, so knowledge is a, is a critical factor, you're right, uh, but, but you can have the most financially sophisticated, most financially literate person making the most fundamental investment mistakes because of emotion. Mm. So uh, I think it's important to know that the, 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 our financial personality 
is, is not always linked to our education about money. So my tolerance for risk, for, 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 for either taking on risk or making a bad decision when things have gone wrong, is hardwired inside me. It's, it would be the same as if I have a phobia for spiders. Uh, it's that kind of a deep-seated emotional issue. And so when, when the stock markets do incredibly well, there will be people that, that are hardwired for that, I want to call it the FOMO gene, you know, fear of missing out. And so when they see Tesla shooting up, they say to themselves, I've got to get in. And no matter how much you try and talk them through it and educate them about, about the potential dangers of the decision, it's going to happen or it's not. Uh, and, and, and it's about their hardwiring. Even more is when the world falls apart. So when stock markets go down, before the stock market crashes, I could sit with you, Petrus, and say, the stock market's going to crash by 30% sometime in the next seven years. Why? Because it happens every seven years, and it could happen twice in, in a, in a seven-year period. Are you ready for that? And you say to mm. me, no problem. I'm, I'm comfortable. I can deal with it. Uh, because that's what you believe. You're not lying. But it might mm. also be the first time it's ever happened to you as an investor. When it happens, it hits you. And emotionally, you either deal with it and you say, oh, okay, this is what he was telling me about. I'm okay with it. Or you fall apart in, you know, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the investment sense and you just say, stop the bus, sell my remaining investments. I can't lose another cent. This thing's never going to recover. Uh, and, and, I'll, and I'll decide to invest again when things get better. Now, now, I mean, who decides when things get better is a, is a great question. But, but the reality is, it's about it's about that emotional roller coaster that's hardwired inside us, and that drives investment markets over the short term. It is yeah. easier for us to become logical and rational as human beings once we look uh, over longer periods of time. So, so once these things pan out over time, we can start to say, oh, okay, I can make a different decision. I think those are probably the big issues. It's it's FOMO and then and then fear and greed and and you know they, they are very linked. Mm, yeah, and it's and it's also quite emotional reaction. So I mean, experience probably has you know a tie into this where like you know you fear of missing out and then you you know if you've experienced FOMO once and then a second time you invest you're like okay I overreacted in this let's you know dial it back and then perhaps you underreact but with experience you get to this kind of medium point where you're like okay this is how I'm supposed to react when the market reacts in this way a moderation and 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 calculation uh, you know ties in or helps a lot with making that a more stable environment. Um, I've also heard, you know, the thing where, you know, I think it may be, maybe you can tell me if it's a more, you know, old school type of thinking, but a lot of people like, if you want really financial investments, buy real estate. It's like real estate, if you buy it in a good environment, if you buy it in a good place, you know, the value will always go up. It's like you can't lose if you go in real estate. But at the same time, the very same people say, oh, no, it's it's such a buyer's market at the moment. You know, nobody wants to, uh, you know, nobody's getting a lot of money for for selling their, their house. A lot of people, you know, are not really interested in buying. So this fluctuates as well. What do you think is the currency? situation in South Africa? And, and is this a fair you know, opinion of real estate investment or not? Uh, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background. So, so um, in, a global, in a global setting, uh, if you look at um, uh, places where we can track the prices of properties, residential specifically, over centuries, mm. uh, um, and, and, the, and there's a brilliant index, which is a, a heck of a mouthful to say, especially if you've had a few drinks, but it's called the Heerenkracht Property Location Index. And it's set in one district in, in, in Amsterdam. Mm. Uh, it's a critical district because the houses have never changed. They're the same size in a high value area. And they've been, been there for 400 years. They've obviously been maintained, but, but literally the physical size is the same. And wow. over 400 years, house prices move an average of half a percent a year above inflation. Wow. Half a percent. Okay. Yeah, uh, that's really to, stable. To give you a, uh, yeah, uh, to, uh, to give you a context with shares, uh, global shares over a 120 year period will, will move at about five and a half percent a year above inflation. So if you said to me, here's the choice, uh, mm -hmm. you know, invest uh, 500,000 euros in a property in the Netherlands, uh, or, or invest 500,000 euros in global shares, uh, I'm going to look at the history mm. and I'm going to say, well, why would I go into the property? Mm. And, and then, you know, add, add the other thing is uh, the jargon is concentration risk. So you're taking all of your 500,000 euros, you're buying one property in one district, in one city, in one place, in one continent. Mm. That doesn't make sense to me about risk. Yes. Uh, whereas I say, well, let's go and buy the global index, you know, nothing, nothing intelligent. It's a really simple thing to buy. Uh, I, I do know management of it. 
um, and it represents, I think it's about 1,500 companies spread across the world, selling across the world, uh, multiple currencies, all of those things. Sounds to me like a different form of, of, of diversification. Sounds to me like mm. my eggs are split in thousands of baskets. So mm. I would say that uh, there are fortunes that have been made in the property market by savvy property investors, like there have been fortunes made by people in any investment market. But right. the, the, the difference is we're all pre-programmed by our parents, grandparents to say, don't buy, buy a property, or sorry, don't pay off the landlord's uh, bond, pay off mm. your own. Yes. And I can only think of one reason. It's because it's the one asset that most of our parents would know what they paid for it. And it's probably the thing they've held the longest period of time. Mm. You know, very few people in our parents' generation, for example, would have said in 1980, let me buy a share and I'll keep it for the next 25 years. And I know what I paid and I know what it's worth today. If they had done, they would all be converted to buying shares and not buying property is the reality. But we don't do that with shares. And so property is the one thing that we can we can kind of identify the price then and what we would sell it for. And I think that's why property has an overinflated, uh, overhyped reputation as an investment mm -hmm. asset uh, and, and shares don't. But, but the, the numbers tell me that I, I should be a share investor and I shouldn't be a property investor. Why do so, you buy a property? Uh, because that's your question, right? You know, is there ever a good time to buy a property? Yes, there is. Uh, and, and let's let's look at uh, clever people like Warren Buffett, who runs Berkshire Hathaway, you know, kind of a smart guy around investing. Uh, he, he buys a house and stays in the house for a period of 25 years or longer. And I think he's probably up to 40 years now. Uh, and, and so when you identify a place where you want to live, you want to settle down, and you're happy to stay in it for about eight years or longer, my calculations say that's a good time to be a buyer of property because now all the transaction costs, the holding costs, all of that stuff gets spread out over a long period of time. Uh, and the rent that you would have paid by year nine or year 10 in the same property would be much higher than your, your holding costs of the property. So that's a good time to buy. Is it a good time to buy in South Africa in April 2021? Yes, uh, I think especially if you buy properties that are worth 4 million rand or more, because mm. there, there are mostly desperate sellers, very few uh, willing buyers. Uh, and, and in the market, that's, let's say, 500,000 to 3.5 million, much more buoyant, many more buyers, low interest rates that are you know, helping them to be able to afford a property, for, for example, maybe for the first time. So, mm. so the answer is, in the one segment, good time to buy, uh, which is the, the, over, the, the oversold part, where, where people are desperately fearful, wanting to semigrate or immigrate. And in the other segment, you know, buy if you're going to stay in it for a long period of time. That's 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 actually amazing, interesting because if you think about it, you have the scenario where you have property that's been it's it, the people hold it for a long time. So the research that so the self research that they're basically doing is kind of speaking for itself for them because they know it's like okay, I bought it then. This is what I paid for it. This is what it's worth now. The research is there quite easy to understand. It's quite accessible to the everyday man. Whereas if you look at shares, that looks on you know at first glance or without proper research to be in such an amount of flux that you're very unsure about where it's going and that's why the research on it is actually a lot more difficult to do but in your case where you've done the research and you've looked at the history and you've seen that shares are more stable over the same period of time and you as a better investment that makes it the obvious choice but not everybody has access to it or not not everybody has you know the the either the time or the energy to do that proper research about what shares is and that's why it's probably a less you know popular where, where it has a you know a, a worse reputation so that's perhaps how your book is actually really really good it's it's a it's an environment where you're taking this financial concepts this research that you've done put a lot of effort in and then make it available for the everyday person because the research therefore is understandable so that's that's really cool one thing which you. you know I always find fascinating is um, not that I'm you know I, I have a, I have a small background a minor in uh, economics um, so I know a bit about this and financial investment but the thing that I always find so interesting is that whenever there's like a stock market hype you know or there's some sort of event that happened then everybody is so confused and every news company tries to get the answer that they're looking for so then they suddenly you know drag in the economists and ask them you know what's going on here and one such scenario was the GameStop saga is suddenly this small company that pretty much everybody's forgotten about in an uh, industry that you know is definitely not the most you know I want to say popular among you know the older people that don't really play games so much and then like what the hell people are making millions off of this what's going on and you had all these news stories going about it could you just give us the you know economists explanation of what exactly happened in the GameStop saga 
So, so uh, I am. Um, I actually need to give you the psychologist's uh, answer because that's really what kicked in here. So, so you had a couple of things. You, you mentioned earlier uh, in, in in the show that that governments were handing out stimulus checks, and 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 that's a critical thing to understand in this thing is that at that time there were thousands, if not millions, of of fairly young investors who who were staying mostly at home, actually with their parents. So, but they were adults, and they were they received these checks of six hundred dollars. You know, that's a sizable chunk of money, uh, you know, anywhere in the world. Um, mm. And they have very, as you said, in, in lockdown, what are they going to spend it on? Mm. And, and so they, they, they have an element of financial education, which is to say, don't just waste your money. So, so they, mm. you know, tick, good, good, good show. Well done. Then, then what they did was that they, they get caught, uh, and, and caught is the right word, in a sort of a social media hype, mm. uh, you know, driven, driven actually by Reddit. Uh, where, where Wall people, Street bets. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. No, so I'm saying driven by Wall Street bets, which is a subreddit. Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, and 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 driven by people with an agenda who 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 are saying I, I I'm I'm finding a fairly small, fairly unloved company uh, probably doesn't really have a good reason to exist in another ten years unless it really changes its business case very soon. Uh, mm -hmm. I've bought the shares. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to hype it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to use social media. I'm going to hype it. So so that starts to happen. At the same time, uh, you have these much hated uh, hedge fund managers in America going on to big you know, TV shows and, and big podcasts saying, this business doesn't have a reason to exist. I am selling the shares in this business. Uh, and, and then doing one step more is actually borrowing other people's shares and I'm selling their shares as well mm. uh, because I'm going to make a lot of money because this thing's going to fall over. Mm. So now you've got young investors uh, with free cash getting hyped on on social media and then you've got the, the, the hated hedge fund managers on the other side that are kind of the poster children for for wall street greed you know billionaires all of this stuff and 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 profiting from previous market crashes where they got a free ride from governments donald trump loves them you know they love donald trump all of mm -hmm. that stuff it's like they're, they're the worst of the worst according to this other group then the the the, the, the hedge fund guy opens his mouth and says i'm shorting now what happens is the, the social media hype says hang on not only is this a good company that we should be investing in, if we drive this share price up, the guy who's now sold the shares that he doesn't even own will have to go and buy those shares back to give them back to the person he borrowed them from. And, and, and in the industry, that's called a short squeeze. So suddenly the shares were going up and up and up in value. The hedge fund managers were getting caught with their pants around their ankles, I mean, almost literally. And, and, and so we, we, we find then that they do have to buy the shares and have to buy them at any price. So that adds momentum to driving the price up. Then the mainstream media gets hold of the story. So mm -hmm. it, it creates a bigger hype outside of just that subreddit and it becomes a mainstream story and more people keep jumping on the, on the bus of buying those GameStop shares, not just now a few people on Robin Hood. Uh, and, and all of a sudden uh, the hedge fund competitors are saying, ah, we know these are now the, the sharks, right? They're circling. There's a blood trail here. Uh, we're going to put one of our competitors out of business and try and make some money. And so they started driving the price up even more. And that's what happened. Uh, mm -hmm. and so, so it caused the share price to absolutely rocket far beyond any logical, rational basis. And then uh, rules and regulations kick in. The, you know, the stockbrokers that have been trading have to say, whoa, 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 hang on. You know, we, we've got capital requirements here. We're going to mm -hmm. stop the trading. Share price collapses. Everyone hates Wall Street again because they think they're protecting the hedge funds. But but the reality is pure hype, pure emotion, uh, for very little logic. Uh, yeah. the, the, those hedge fund managers, I'm I'm going to state clearly, I don't like hedge funds. I don't. I think they're too expensive. I don't like people that profit by destroying other people's businesses. So so I'm yeah. I'm on the side of the, the the Reddit crowd in this argument. But yeah. those hedge fund managers were correct. The business doesn't really have a reason. It's in South Africa. Music is closed out. It didn't have a reason yep. to exist anymore. GameStop, unless it changes, you know, yep. it, it, why, why should it exist? We mm -hmm. don't buy games, physical games anymore. You know, we buy them online. Yeah. No, exactly. And I think I think it might have been a scenario of where, just like you just explained. I mean, these these um, youngsters had a relative, you know primary understanding of economics and they you know knew not to waste the money so they want to invest it but they just also had this 
popular science type scenario where it's like I there's a supervillain and I can be the superhero and that's just you know it drove them uh to 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 take these actions but at the same time it was kind of like a a lesson as well I think so many people learned about investing through this process or through this action um that it might you know in general actually have a quite positive response despite the fact that I'm pretty sure a lot of people that bought into the hype quite later lost a lot of money well um I, I think it's an optimistic view, uh, and I would love it if you were right. Uh, hi history tells us that uh, that, that we're, we're, it's, it's simply another investment bubble, one of many hundreds, many thousands, uh, and, and it will definitely repeat itself in the future again. Uh, and and that, that's just the nature of human beings. You know, we can say to everyone, put your mask on, you know, be careful, don't drink and drive, and, you know, here's all the lessons, here are the examples, and, you know, don't do it. And... The reality is different, right? I mean, we yeah. see the examples. So yeah. uh, I don't want to say thank goodness because the, the, you know people die from from stupidity and and from ignorance um, mm. and and simply ignoring rules. But but at the same time, if we didn't have that kind of uh, uh, dynamic, then there wouldn't be opportunities for savvy investors to make money. We would mm. just have yeah. perfect information all the time. Yeah, yeah. So I, I want to pivot this to a bit of a different type of um, investment story. Uh, I think we had somebody that we talked about, which was also a financial professor um, the other day, where we talked about um, cryptocurrencies um, as this, you know, it's it's kind of like the, I almost want to say it's also a kind of a social movement as well. There's this idea of, you know, people get more educated in terms of how banks work, then they don't like the way that banks work, they have the vendetta against banks, and now they're trying to create a new environment where they're pretty much, you know, circumventing banks. We have a currency that is quite literally controlled by supply and demand, and therefore you can almost say controlled by the people. Um, and so we have we have cryptocurrencies, which, you know, and also a technological marvel in of itself. So it's quite an interesting environment, but people are just too unsure about it and it's too fluctuating to necessarily be stable. Could you please just give us a brief rundown on, you know, what is Bitcoin and what is your perspective on this? Perhaps some things say, some of the things I just said are completely wrong. I'd, I'd like to be uh, you know corrected on this. Yeah, I feel um, I, I always feel uh, an element of trepidation when I talk about this, because uh, if I don't say uh, only positive things about Bitcoin. My social media feed blows up with the haters, um, yes. and 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 usually it's two sets of things. One, I'm an ignorant dinosaur. I'm too old to understand or too stupid. Uh, or the second is I represent the system, and and you know and the system feels threatened by 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 Bitcoin, and so of course I'm going to protect the system. Uh, and 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 I think uh, you know truthfully, people need to start this conversation by saying we can understand the technology. Uh, and, and maybe the system behind Bitcoin, uh, and and we can understand, you know, some rationale around around the method of moving money or moving value, but what we can't do, none of us, not no one, can actually say we know how this movie is going to end. This is not a movie that anyone's seen before, uh, and so all of us are, are are talking on the fly. I feel like I feel it's a bit like building a bridge while you're crossing the river. Mm -hmm. You, you lay a plank, you go forward, you lay a plank, you go forward, and you hope that you get to the other side, you hope you've got enough bridges, but it might fall over. Hmm. So, so what is Bitcoin? In, in essence, the, the back end of Bitcoin is, is based on uh, you know, a, a technology called blockchain. And hmm. all that really does is it says that you know, across thousands, if not millions of places in the world, there is a kind of, it almost you want to imagine like an accountant sitting there with, with a book and saying, okay, you know, Warren owns this um, and it's only Warren's. And, and then when I sell it, the, the accountant says, okay, Warren sold it and he sold it to Petrus. Mm -hmm. And then there are thousands and millions of these accountants sitting all over the place, all doing that at the same time. So that if I arrive with my gang and we go and rob the accountant of that ledger that he's got in Joburg, there are many more that I have to get on planes to go and rob all the others. And I don't even know where they all are. And I don't even know who they all are. So, yeah. so it's a way of saying we can track how, how value moves from point A to point B or from one person to another. And it's a way of, of identifying that it moves and that no one can kind of corrupt it. No one can, can step in the middle and stop the, the, the process of identifying that movement from point A to point B. Hmm. Great. Uh, I, I think it's a deeply valuable technology. It has application in many different aspects. So, for example, a, kind of a company like Walmart wants to know when it sells an apple, it wants to know where was that apple actually farmed, where, when was it picked, how did it get to the shop that it's being sold from. It wants to know all of that information, 
and blockchain is an incredibly helpful way for Walmart to do that. So they are doing that. Uh, and and it, you can see the applications in millions of different kinds of ways. It's not just financial. But now you add an overlay, which is, well, if we've got this, that means we can actually move value from a person in South Africa to a person in America, and we can do it like that mm. without going through a banking system. Uh, and, and I think maybe to add to your, your, your comment around people who are anti-bank, they're also anti-government. Mm. Uh, they, they, they're, they're in a position where they don't necessarily trust that governments are managing currencies correctly anymore. You know, if you look at America, people are saying Americans are just printing money all day long, getting more and more debt, and one day that party is going to end, and it will cause the collapse of the American dollar and the end of the American financial system. We need to find another way. So, yeah. so there are some good reasons why people are doing this. Uh, but, but, but the reality is that this method of moving value from point A to point B has, has morphed and now people are saying it's not just a way of buying and selling stuff or value. Now we can actually make money out of it. We can actually buy it and hope that it goes up in value and then sell it to someone else. And yes, it'll be instant and all those things. But, but actually what we want to do is we want to make money out of that. So if you ask me my, my thoughts on Bitcoin at the moment, it's starting, to, uh, it's starting to be understood better by financial institutions. It's also starting to be traded through bigger financial institutions, which mm. is a critical point because uh, these wallets that they've got, these crypto wallets and crypto platforms are notoriously easy to, to hack. Um, yeah. And the very nature of Bitcoin is that you actually don't know the name of the person who owns it. So, so if, I, if I steal your your Bitcoins, you won't know who I am. And yeah. I've got them, you can't find me, we're, 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 I'm, I'm on my way. So if I find ways to steal lots of Bitcoins from lots of people, I can become a billionaire and lots of people are doing it. Uh, and and I kind of, I have, I have no, one, no, no way of being traced. Um, you know, as long as I don't get hacked and I can convert my Bitcoin to gold or to diamonds or to property or whatever the deal is, you know, kind of a, a free and clear crime. Hmm. So, so now, the, the method of moving value has become an investment. And I think that's dangerous. So, so to me, uh, what it's starting to look like is almost a store of value. And, and, and that sounds like semantics, but, but a store of value, another example, which is millions of years old, is gold. So if you look at gold, you would say gold's not linked to the dollar. It's not linked to uh, you know, the rand, the pound, the euro. It's just this thing. It's a, it's a lump of metal um, and, and it, I, can, I can give it to you uh, and you've got it and you can give me something in exchange. So it's a, it's a, it's in a way to move value from point A to point B. Uh, it's not tradable. It doesn't have any, uh, you know, marks on it. If you don't want them, you can melt it down. And it's absolutely certain that there is this much gold. It's, it's a kilogram or whatever it is, uh, but it doesn't generate rent, doesn't generate dividends, doesn't generate interest. So, so what I do is if I buy gold, I'm hoping that I can find a time to sell it to you when you think it's worth more than what I paid. So it's, it's simply a store of value. It's not a productive asset like a business or a property or a, a farm or something like that. I think that's where we've arrived for now with Bitcoin is it's becoming the alternative to gold. It's becoming a, a way of protecting yourself from a collapse of other different kinds of financial systems. Is it a safe way? Is it going to be regulated literally to death is a good question because what, what the, the, the kind of Bitcoin lovers don't answer the question about how much of Bitcoin is traded by uh, people who do uh, human trafficking, people yeah. that sell drugs, terrorists, you know, yeah. Russian mafia, you know, North Korean dictators, you know, uh, um, you know th those kinds of things. Hmm. Because some of the attraction of, of Bitcoin uh, is, is, is that it's anonymous, uh, yeah. is that it's easy to move. Uh, and we need to talk about that. And, hmm. and the other thing is, if you love the environment, you can't love Bitcoin, right? Because hmm. The, the amount of computing power it's requ that's required now to generate bitcoins is, it's, I mean, in a way, in an environmental crime. And, and yeah. so, so I feel probably we need to evolve it still to, to become either a store of value that everyone can use and it's safe and we're not dealing with terrorists and, and human smugglers and all of that stuff, or the financial system will come up with a better way of doing financial transactions that will kill Bitcoin. And then the governments, of course, don't want to be regulated out of existence mm. because that's what Bitcoin can do. You know, if, if, mm. if Bitcoin became a global currency, why would I pay tax? Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and how would, how would this, the, the government force me to give them the money? How would they know I've got the money? So, so there is a threat to, to, to governments who maybe are reckless, who maybe aren't managing the, the financial system correctly. But, but but there's some real 
human moral issues with with, with mm. Bitcoin at the moment. And that's that's I, I, I like your golden analogy so much because it makes so much sense that you have this scenario where you 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 basically have this, like you said, the store of value, right? But the problem is or the difference between this and this is the part where I think the risk conversation comes in is that if you store your value of your, your money in gold, then even, you know, if everything goes terribly wrong and people don't want to use gold as a store of value, gold in of itself is still a valuable metal. Like you can either use it for jewelry or for electronics. It's a great conductor, you know, it's a great, you know, there's, there's a lot of use for this material. So there will be a scenario in which people want it. Whereas if, I want to say Bitcoin loses its store of value. It doesn't have any intrinsic value in of itself as as a material or or, or substance. It, in fact, by being digital, it is by extension doesn't have a substance. So it's sure it's difficult to steal. It's difficult to to regulate um, in terms of like where it goes and who spends it and stuff like that. But it's also at the same time doesn't have intrinsic value. So for example, I think oh, you can tell me if this is right or wrong. But the impression I got is if somebody, for example, were to be able to you know, hack into Coinbase, or they were hack into a Luno, for example, right? And they were able to somehow get the entire part of the blockchain that Luno owns, or basically all the users on Luno owns. And then they would steal it, and they would have it now, and Luno can't get it back. I mean, that, that's, that, is a, that is a type of like a breach of trust situation that would, people, that would make people go, I mean, I just lost so much money that I put into Bitcoin. Screw this currency, it's definitely not safe. And then they leave the currency, and then it you know, it bottoms out, it, lo it loses all of its supporting base. So it feels like it's a bit precariously held on, on poles in that scenario. It, it, you can tell me if I'm right or wrong, but in terms of the risk, is there anything that inherently, you know, supports or pegs Bitcoin? Because that's a discussion the whole time. It's like the dollar is pegged against the US military, for example, or whatever, you know, or there was all of the gold stand in the history. Is there anything that actually pegs cryptocurrencies? No, there, there isn't. Uh, it's it's a belief. Uh, it's a belief in the value, and and um, I, I'll, I'll, I, so I think you're 100 percent right on Bitcoin. I think you're probably wrong on on the dollar. The dollar has no intrinsic value either. Um, okay. in, in fact, it's a belief. We believe that the American government will be able to to honor its debts. You know, and and so we we believe that the dollar has value, but. But the intrinsic value of the dollar is literally the value of that piece of paper. Actually, that that mm -hmm. is the intrinsic value. Uh, so there is no, you know, if you had to say to the Americans, like, you know, you've got whatever it is, ten trillion dollars of of our money, give us uh, an exchange in gold and silver and platinum, they wouldn't be able to do it. They they they, they, they would be bankrupt. The, the day mm -hmm. if the rest of the world said we we don't believe the dollar uh, has value anymore, they would be right. The, the, the simple fact that they believe it would be the reason why the dollar would end. And, and that's the reality of all modern currencies. It's only a belief in the strength of the government, the economy uh, th that it represents. It's not really, you know, if the American military, uh, you know, strong- Enforces well, it. So what? You know, it, yeah. it doesn't mean yeah. anything. I, I'm, I'm, li I'm, I'm living at the tip of Africa. Uh, what, what's the American military going to say? You know, buy our dollars or we bomb you. Well, like, yeah. We've got a lot of people to bomb all around the world. Uh, I'm yeah. sure I'm last on your list. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, my, my follow up question would, to that would then be if you really want to have a world financial system that is based in something, you know, solid or substantial, would a return to the gold standard even be something that people would consider? Or are we so past the point of where a money has, has lost all physical value? It's now completely representative. That's impossible to do so. Yeah. I think we've. Okay. I, I think we long past the the gold story. Uh, maybe it's a basket of of rare earth minerals, or okay. maybe it's something. I, I'm I'm not sure. Um, I, I think I think in the, in this world we, we're accelerating into the into the, the the digitization of stuff. You know, if you can sell a tweet mm. for two not what's a two and a half million dollars? Yes. Uh, uh, then then I, I, do, I don't see us returning to gold. As a, mm. as a method of, you know, you might overlay a digital uh, transaction method, but but the, the the reality is it's it's still physical stuff that has to sit in a vault somewhere. I, I think we're long past that. There isn't enough gold to underpin the value of all of the countries in the world's currencies now, um, and, and so the system is due uh, due for a shakeup. I think, but 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 I don't believe it's the gold standard. I don't know what mm. it is to be honest. So, so if you're going to ask me that, I, I'll I'll tell you when I've seen the end of the movie. But but uh, yes. I'm not sure what it is. 
Exactly, exactly. So we're trying to predict the end of the movie, and quite frankly, it's impossible. But educating on how the movie goes so far helps a lot of people to make the right choices. Hopefully, they get a you know a better ending. At least that's that's the optimistic spin I would like to put on it. Um, but anyways, we've we've talked about this quite long enough. I, I kind of want to pivot again to investments. Um, there's a lot of people that. Uh, especially in South Africa, have this fear that the assets that they necessarily invest in South Africa um, won't hold its value because of political or economic, um, you know, pressures or even foreign invest in, in, in intervention in certain regards. Like, for example, you know, how much uh, loans we're getting from, say, China, for example. There's, there's a lot of there's a lot of unsurety and the the way that, at least in my perspective, people deal with that is they're like, okay, it's fine. You know, I'm, I'm just going to I'm just going to take a bunch of my capital. I'm going to put it in a different currency and then I'm going to invest it in that currency. So a lot of people are sending it to, you know, the US to invest in their stock market. A lot of people are sending it perhaps to Europe because it's a very stable currency. You know, so you have the scenario where people are investing offshore. What is your advice and perhaps even what's your perspective on this? You know, how, how what advice would you give others to how to diversify or invest offshore? I think uh, investors everywhere in the world have what they call a home bias. In other words, yeah. We, we, we are all naturally overinvest in the country in which we live. Uh, and, and we are always somewhat wary of investing in other countries. Uh, and and that there's some of that's it's human, it's far away. And it's on the other side of an ocean. I don't understand the language, the laws, whatever the deal is. So, so there, there is an element of fear and lack of knowledge uh, about other countries. So, so if you were an American, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you the answer to the South African now, but if you were an American, you know, you would live in a country that represents more than half of the world's economy in terms of size, you would represent more than half of the world's stock markets in terms of value, uh, you know, the bulk of the world's technology, you know, for now and, and until, until the, you know, the, 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 the East overtake completely, but, but, but it makes sense that you would have a big chunk of your money in the US, it, it, right. there's no reason not to. It doesn't make sense to have all of your money in America because Samsung is not in America. You know, mm. uh, uh, you know, some of the pharmaceutical businesses are in Switzerland. They're not in America, and and some potentially some of the new technologies that we see in making the new generation of chips is made in Taiwan. You know, and mm. and designed somewhere else. So so it makes sense to to spread your assets across a range of different baskets. And in in the, in the investment sense, that means everybody. Once you start to build up a long term global or sorry, a long term investment focus, you should have global investments. So then the question is not whether you should, it's about how much and when. Mm. And my view, it starts by saying, how much capital do you have? And how much are you likely to have? So so in, South, in, the, in the, coming back to your question about the South African, I think all South Africans at a minimum should have about 25% of their investments outside of South Africa. Uh, okay. And and that's not specifically dependent on your political views, on your on your uh, optimism or pessimism about the prospects of the country. It's simple, rational investment diversification. So so then the question is, why should you have more than twenty five percent? And that comes down to a few things. One, uh, I think if you've got enough money, uh, where, where you're pretty certain that you're going to have enough money by the time you stop work or by the time you pass away that you're going to leave money to the next generation. So at least to, if you're going to have children to, to, to one generation after you, mm. then my view is you, you should probably have half your, your money in South Africa. And now I'm talking about all money. In other words, the value of your home, your, yeah. your business, your investments, everything, half of your assets in South Africa, half uh, global. Mm. Why would you have more than that? If you are pretty certain, and you're now in the one percent uh, of the of the world's wealthy, where you you're pretty certain your children will leave money to their children, uh, mm. so so now you've got your 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 time frame is now fifty to seventy five years. You, you don't know what's going to happen anywhere in the world. So so when I don't know what's going to happen, I spread my risks as far and as wide as possible, which means South Africa should represent twenty five percent of your assets, and overseas investments should represent seventy five. So. Mm. On a, on a kind of a structural methodology, uh, methodology that would be my, my answer. Why would you do it differently? Well, if you are a pure Afro pessimist, you know, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I meet people say my parents came from Zimbabwe or, you know, I, I look at I look north of our borders and look at what's happened there. It's coming to South Africa. It's just a matter of time, whatever that story is. Th then the answer is keep building up your capital offshore uh, to the point where some people um, live in South Africa, but they live as financial expats. In other words, right. all their assets are out of South Africa, 
uh, they, they generate an income from those assets that's spent here where they keep their cost base low they enjoy the wonderful life and weather and climate and in the parks and you know human humans that we have in our country but they're not exposed to the politics and the economics of our of our country uh, mm. I, i'm not convinced that that's the best view but but i feel that most of us should have at the very least 25 percent offshore i think that that, that uh to, sorry uh, 25 to 50. Uh, yeah. my, my kind of personal comfort level would be 50 percent offshore because if things really go wrong here i could probably live somewhere else and, and not live like a pauper uh, so, so that would be the methodology I would apply to a decision like that. And then when do you do it? You do it when the rand is is unusually strong. So when the rand is, you know, at 14 rand 50 to the dollar, I think in 2021, that's a good level. When, when it's sitting at 18 rand to the dollar, like it was in parts of 2020, don't do it. It's an expensive time, rather, rather wait. Uh, last comment, don't buy into the fear mongering. There are people in my industry that spend their time in the media saying, you know, South Africa's ter terrible, cash in your retirement funds, buy a Mauritian property, you know, send it all offshore. Of course, they want you to send it to their offshore fund, you know, but that's yeah. a, a typical <laughs> issue. Uh, and, and you know, we, we know what we're talking about. You don't, you're an idiot, you know, don't invest in South Africa, don't trust the government. I mean, there's a huge racial issue that bothers me there about, uh, about you know, the Afro-pessimism by a privileged few, but, but over and above that, people who are naturally predisposed to negativity um, and, and naturally predisposed to the problems we have, which are obvious, but they ignore any kind of positive. Uh, you know, and, and I think that that's a mistake. You know, I, I'm not saying South Africa is absolutely certain to, to come out of this, uh, th these troubles that we've been in and come out of it better and, and be, become kind of the next you know, miracle country in the world. I don't have a clue how, again, it's a different movie. I don't know how that movie unfolds, but, but I feel that it's wrong to say, we're definitely going to be brilliant or we're definitely going to be uh, awful. We actually don't know the answer. We've got some elements of both. Um, and it's it's actually great that you talked about um, how you invest in terms of how far you look into the future. It's like if you want to leave something for your kids, then you need to have a percentage of your finances in South Africa um, because that's the way in which it gets divided um, if you were to pass away. But that said, we recently did an interview with uh, Professor Pierre de Foss. Uh, where he called for a significantly higher income tax in terms of um, uh, how much how much money you're allowed to leave for your children, and and he said potentially up to a hundred percent. In other words, you know you invest in your children in terms of a good education and you know helping them with when they get their first house or you know giving them presents or you know setting them up in life and then that's his perspective on all that really needs to be done after that when you die that like capital that just goes over to them he doesn't necessarily uh, he doesn't necessarily see a value in that intrinsically we we, we want to know what your opinion is on this um, sorry, I mean, I mean, inheritance tax, not income tax, inheritance tax. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, sorry. Uh, what is your opinion on the practicality and the morality of such a cause? Um, it sounds uh, kind of a quasi-communist, socialist, uh, you know, uh, warm, fluffy slipper, slippers, let's sing kumbaya kind of a view of the world by an academic rather than someone who understands human beings. Uh, because if you understand human beings, then you understand there is no, there is no communist system anywhere in the world that has worked. Yes. Uh, the, the, you know, people say China is a communist country. Well, that's rubbish. Uh, mm. you know, it's, it's kind of a brutal capitalist system, uh, you know, with a different paint, uh, pa paintbrush. Uh, mm. and, and so I think that, that I mean, we're talking about a view and it's an opinion. So my opinion is that that's hog, hogwash. Uh, I think it's garbage. Uh, and, and, and not that he's not a good uh, academic, but, but the point is, uh, we're, we are ultimately, again, driven by fear and greed. So mm -hmm. if you know that you just need to sit back and do nothing and wait for me to die, and my money is going to go into the system and you can get a handout from, from my money, uh, mm -hmm. what incentive do you have to work? Yeah. That's a real question. I mean, what, what is the incentive? And, and there isn't one. Uh, now, you might have some inherent goodness in you that says, oh, I want to make the world better for everybody else. Well, uh, you know, the, why, why doesn't everyone wear a mask? You know, mm. why do people steal? Why is there corruption? Why? Because we're not all good. Mm. Uh, and actually, we are incentive driven. And, and, and so I'm not saying that we shouldn't have a, some kind of a social support uh, structure for, for everybody and the, and the poorest of the poor and find a way to give them education and, and health care and those things. But if you say, let's take away all the incentives for people to build uh, an asset 
that they can at least protect their children from the worst of the of the financial crimes that the world can throw at them or un, unexpected disasters. Um, all we're going to give them is education, and then they must start afresh. Uh, the, the, then, then as a parent, I, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend all of that money because I'm not going to give it to you when I know you're going to sit on your butt and do nothing and just wait for it to arrive. So I, I think it's a rubbish system. I mean, I, I can I can understand that that you're trying to solve a problem. Which is good. So, so you know, they talk about the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Yes. This is this is a great example. I mean, you, you need to give people incentives to build wealth so that they can go to the next generation. Should you have a wealth tax? Yes, we've got one already. What we need to do is find a better way to look after the most underserved people in our country. Yes, I, I think a universal basic income might be a much better answer. But hundred uh, percent death duties. Uh, I mean, th that's a terrible movie. I don't want to be part of it. I don't even want to watch the trailer. So but I just want to pick on something that you specifically said that, that was so interesting to me is, is if you have a 100% income tax, the natural progression, the problem that you're trying to solve is you didn't want to, um, sorry, inheritance tax. I said that wrong every time. If you're 100% inheritance tax, um, you then inherently have a problem where you're trying to solve, where you're trying to build up the people that are the least um, uh, I want to say financially well off in the country, right? That's that's a problem that's going to be solved. But inherently, you have a common situation where instead of you giving that money to your children, you're now giving that money to everybody to basically not incentivize them to work or build up a capital. So it's it is in a sense basically what you're doing with an inheritance. Um, you know, if if, you, if somebody it's all the scenario where like the super rich person that built up their own um, you know uh, financial portfolio through hard work and years of work, um, you know, sometimes they don't teach their children correctly or they don't educate them correctly. And the kid's like, I don't really have to do anything because I'm just going to grow up with, you know, my parents' money and then I'll be fine. But if you do in a 100% inheritance tax, you basically do that on an entire country level. So you don't have any incentive for people to build up at all. And also, if you have, for example, you know, the financial incentives to be able to provide for your children, uh, you know, after you're dead, you can at least provide them with a good education in terms of how to use the money because you have a personal investment in how that money was earned. So you don't want them to go and say, okay, I don't need to do anything because I'll just get this money. You want them to build up the same way because that money's not going to last forever. So there, there is a scenario where it's, perhaps it's, it's a better way of incentivizing people, even though they are going to get a payout to perform better. Do, do I understand that correctly? Yeah, I, I, I hear you. I think um, what bothers me is you're taking away my choice with an inheritance tax, 100% inheritance tax. Right. Uh, and and so my choice might be to to leave, uh, let, let, let's say, a healthy deposit on a house for my kids. Or, uh, you know, in the new world where large corporate jobs are getting less and less and entrepreneurs are becoming more and more viable, I, I would like to leave my, my, my children the ability to become entrepreneurs without uh, without having to kind of go into the you know into the poverty handout queue uh, and, and find like an easy way for them to take off uh, and then it's my choice as a parent how I educate them about money how I transfer the knowledge how I transfer the capital if I choose to do it badly what will happen is the money will naturally be redistributed to the rest of the country because my kids will spend like idiots um, and there will be a lot of consumption that will go back into the country buy lots of stuff create jobs and and so and most fortunes don't last to the third generation. So this inherent idea that, you know, that money kind of uh, the money from the ultra wealthy just stays and never gets distributed back into the system is rubbish. Uh, mm -hmm. And and if you make if you look at some of the world's wealthy, they are also some of the world's greatest philanthropists. There are people that are that have the financial luxury luxury to stop to look at the world's problems and say, I'd like to solve these problems deeply with proper money with a long term focus and, and they make a real contribution. What, what we're deciding now is, no, 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 let's take all of that, give it to an elected official who's going to be in power for four years, and, and they somehow are better positioned to think more deeply about money than the people that have created it. I, yeah. I, can't, I can't stand the idea. I think it's an awful idea. Yeah, no, exactly. And it makes so much sense to me because generally, if you look just at the state owned enterprises in South Africa, I really wouldn't want to send my money to them anyhow, because, you know, they seem to be quite bad at managing money, whereas people that have had made a success in making money, they generally have a better idea of how that money could be spent. So no, it's, it's an incredibly valuable perspective. And I want to thank you so much for it. I just want to I give you a lot of talk about universal basic income, though, because let's, that's a solution. If you, I mean, if you want an academic to do a proper study, why don't mm -hmm. we say this? Everybody in South Africa from the age of 18 gets 8,000 Rand a month. Mm. Everybody. Doesn't matter your economic status, et cetera, et cetera. 
from that 8,000 rand a month, before you receive it in your bank account, you have to put on an online form, which, which is linked to your ID to say, this is the medical aid I'm choosing. And that gets, that gets paid directly from your, from your, your, your 8,000 income. rand. Hmm. The, 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 this is the, the private school I'm choosing for my children. And that gets paid. This is the, uh, the, the this is the retirement fund contribution I'm making, and that gets deducted. And then you get the balance, hmm. and and none of that stuff must be provided by a government. So so the government must provide the money. Our taxes give it to the government. The government says, we'll we'll maintain the system so that it's not corrupt and that it doesn't get uh, defrauded. And then you elect where it goes. Medical aid uh, is all private. Hospitals are private. Education system is private. And watch how, I mean, we, we suddenly go from a medical aid system of five or eight million people to 60 million people, a private education system that, that does the same, uh, and so on and so on and so on. We have a huge system that can really support our country. We could probably afford it tomorrow. Hmm. We don't hmm. need to do this inheritance tax garbage. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, there's probably, I mean, the, the, the problem is that the ideal scenario there would be that the government is then not the, he's not a player in the field, he's rather the referee in the sense that he manages that there isn't any corruption or, or fraud in terms of the way that the money is is diversified. But I think this is perhaps the issue that a lot of people have with any form of tax. So not even just inheritance tax, just any form of tax is people would be more willing to spend the money, or sorry, provide the money for the government. So they'd be more willing to pay tax if they had any type of, you know, assurance that their money was being allocated uh, fairly. I think I think that's perhaps where it comes down to. So it doesn't really matter how you talk about the tax, it talks about how it's being spent. In that environment, perhaps we have the solution for universal pay income, and that would be a fantastic um, uh, financial study to do, to see how that situation would play out. Yeah, and yeah. and and the, the key is the government should be small, yeah. uh, the, government, uh, the, the, the government should be efficient, and it should be run by technocrats who don't like to be in the front page of, of newspapers and on TV and you know uh, 5 million Twitter followers. These are people that are there simply to do an implementation role. You can, if, if you're the, if you're the, the mayor of, of a town in Switzerland or in Scandinavia, I promise you, you can get on the bus or the train, which is how you get around. Uh, and, and, and you can sit next to your citizens. They probably don't know who you are. They won't recognize your photo and, and they would be happy with the job that you're doing or they'll vote you out. Uh, mm. But, but you know, it's not a big prestigious, you know, look at me role like a Donald Trump or like, you know, Jacob mm. Zuma kind of up and they're two peas of the pe same pod, by the way, mm. Uh, mm. you know, like egotists, we, we, need, we, mm. we need to get rid of egotists. And I think a system like, like that UBI with no government provision of services would be an awesome solution. Mm, yeah, no, you, we currently really have a popularity contest, which is in a lot of parts in the world turned into a reality show. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of badness there. But anyways, uh, we've, we've taken enough of your time. I just want to give you a last opportunity to add anything or say anything else you might wanted to say before we end this off. No, no, I must put my soapbox away now. And, uh, and, <laughs> and uh, I think I've run out of things to say and I've upset enough people already. No, it's of course, but I think uh, giving your perspective and, and having people be able to look at that in, uh, you know, ingest it and think about it in terms of how they want to adjust their perspectives on how to do things, I think is the most valuable part here. So it's the most important part in terms of all of our interviews and all the people we talk with is just take this and then internalize it, see how you learn and see how educa educated you can get and what perspectives there is exist in the world. So for that, we just want to thank you so much. And, you know, thank you so much for giving your honest opinion as well. It's really, really good to have people respect that significantly more um, than some preparation prepared politician speech, for example, which we all know far too well. So yeah, I just want to say thank you so much to Warren for, for joining us. Um, for our viewers specifically, if you've made it thus far, you've most definitely liked it. And if you want to share uh, Warren's perspective and you know, make sure that other people also get to know how this works and be more educated about it, please share this video. Obviously, of course, just also helps the channel out immensely in terms of the growing and getting perspectives out there. So, so that's been it. If you want to support us financially in terms of how to provide this uh, platform for more people to talk to and more interviews, please check out our Patreon links in the description below. So thank you so much for watching. This has been Worldview.